can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have William Harris of Element. It's spelled differently. So if you're going to check it out, it's E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com, which I'll formally introduce you, William, in a second. Before I do, I always like to point out other episodes people check out of the podcast. Since I know that you run EOS. Um, I did an interview with Gino Wickman. Um, check that one out. It, it's fantastic. Um, we were talking about in our last conversation, Chris Voss, uh, one of my favorite books of all time, Never Split the Difference. And he has some amazing uh, takeaways there. And uh, Chad Rubin, right? Chad Rubin actually introduced us. And um, he was your nemesis at one point uh, <laughs> when <laughs> when uh, he was running Scubana, which he has now sold. Um, and I interviewed him when at the Prosper show that we were both at, and now he runs Prophecy. But um, we'll get more in about Chad Rubin and your rivalry, but now you're not rivals anymore. But check out those and, and many other episodes at uh, inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to your dream 100 relationships and how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. We do strategy, accountability, and full execution of a business's podcast. We've been doing it for over a decade. Um, you know, for me, William, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than the profile of people and companies I most admire on this planet and share with the world what they're doing. Uh, and so if you thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. We also did an episode on the five different types of episodes every podcast should create. So I encourage people to check that out because I feel like I repeat that five times a day every day. So it's easier if you just listen to it so my voice doesn't go hoarse. But without further ado, William, thanks for joining me. Uh, William Harris is a founder and CEO of Element, which is an e-commerce growth agency focused on profit not just return on ad spend. And we're going to talk and dig deep on that because they have a really strong philosophy on that. And he's helped 13 companies get acquired, including one that sold to GoDaddy and another that sold for nearly $800 million. And Element was recently featured as an Inc. 5000 winner, as well as an Inc. Best Workplace winner. And I want to talk more about what are the things you do? Uh, from a best workplace standpoint. And he's published over 200 articles in e-commerce, advertising leadership, in entrepreneur, fast company, Shopify, and many more. And basically, I guess when I do my research, when I, I think of your team as helping businesses in hyperscaling, right? So thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Jeremy. It's great to be here. So tell me about Element and exactly what you do. Yeah, I think you uh, you summed it up very well. I appreciate it. Um, the biggest focus for us when we're looking at growing e-commerce stores, which is what we're focused on, um, one of the things that we noticed, and I, I had a SaaS background before we got into e-commerce, uh, was a lot of e-commerce stores were so focused on like the, just the immediate transaction of what was taking place that they were missing out on what went uh, taking that to the next level a little bit beyond. Um, one of the things that we we found is that a lot of people weren't looking at necessarily the profitability of their advertising. They're looking at their return on ad spend, which was just looking at top line revenue divided by ad spend. Um, but, you know, let's just say that you've got a, one product that is uh, $200 and let's say your margin on that $200 product is $25. Let's say that you have a $100 product that has a margin of $50 on it. Well, you might actually sell a whole lot more and get a higher return on ad spend by selling the $200 product, but you're actually, you know, half as profitable on that. And so we like to look at how do we actually maximize the profitability of what we're doing from advertising? And that could be um, on a unit basis, like kind of what I just explained it. It can also be in an aggregate basis. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we go in to, in to do that. And I don't know how deep we want to get into the the tactics and the technique that we're doing, but uh there's a lot of ways to focus on that being the, the primary 
uh, driver. Well, talk about, you know, William, it brings up a good point because I'm sure your discovery process is very comprehensive because you have to figure all of these things out. And I'm sure a lot of companies don't figure this stuff out. There's like, give us your products. You you know better than me. And let's let's get people to buy these things. So what does the discovery process look like that you can kind of figure out these really key elements that focus on profit and not just return on ad spend? Yeah. So for, you know, a lot of businesses, we actually want to get uh, some type of like a spreadsheet or if they have like a data feed uh, of their their cogs, that's a big help for us because then we can look at at least specific to the to the SKUs, then we can actually feed that information back into Google and we can make sure that even not just us, but Google is optimizing towards the products that are more profitable for them, which gives it it's a whole other level of excitement there. Um, but otherwise, we're just looking at ideally getting the, the basic numbers from them, such as like, what is your COGS as a percentage of sales on an average basis? What is your overhead on average? What is your shipping cost on average? What is your uh, returns cost on average? Like at least get some kind of like uh, an analog to your P&L. But ideally, we like to get to the P&Ls. Usually we don't get into P&Ls uh, before we sign clients, getting some kind of an analog. But then once we sign clients, probably about 40% of our customers actually uh, share their P&L directly with us. And what's interesting is uh, that's not something that even t- traditionally the marketing teams were even aware of a lot of times. And so the marketing team has their objective uh, in, and they're not even aware of that. And we had this, uh, this customer and, and uh, it was interesting where the first month we came on board, we were able to scale them significantly. Uh, and our, our bill for that, I want to say it went from like $10,000 is what they were used to paying for the advertising management. Um, and, and our bill was maybe $20,000, you know, almost like double what they were paid or something like that. Uh, and I remember the marketer at this company was like, wow, like that's twice what we're used to paying. Like, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Like, uh, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't good kind of thing. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember, we talked about this before we started. We we met with your finance team, which is a big part of what we try to do before we even you know move forward with the business. Meet with whoever's on finance, um, and, and we said we were able to spend X amount more. So you made this much more top line revenue. Subtract the cogs. Subtract your overhead. Subtract your uh, returns uh, costs. Subtract your uh, shipping. Subtract the ad spend. Subtract the management fee, and you actually made about eight hundred thousand dollars more in a single month after starting to work with us, is it okay that it costs an extra $10,000 to make that $800,000 in more profit? Um, and he was like, well, yeah, you put it that way. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly how I'd like to put it. <laughs> I love that because, you know, there could be some agency owners listening to this, right? And sure. talking about value-based pricing, right? So mm-hmm. how did you, you know, cause you could have easily been like, listen, I don't want to ruffle any felt. Let's just keep it at the 10,000. And I'm sure on the surface, you get pushback. But when you dig deeper and do, oh, you make 800,000, you paid us an extra 10. Is that okay? Right? Right? (laughs) Was it always like when you first started the agency, what were you doing? Yeah. So, you know, we, we still bill based on a percentage of ad spend. And so like the the framework it hasn't changed since what we're doing. And I'd say that we've, we test out a lot of other uh, billing uh, options. Uh, one that we tested out was the percentage of revenue, which a lot of people tested out. There were problems with that. And one of the problems with percentage of revenue is, well, how are you going to define that revenue? Uh, you ideally want to define it as revenue that was directly impacted by ads. Well, Google took credit for it. Facebook took credit for it. TikTok took credit for it. Email took credit for it, but it was still just one sale. And so that got muddy, whereas the ad spend, it's a fact. As long as we're saying we're optimizing the ad spend towards what you ultimately want, which is I don't want to spend more money to not make more money. I actually want to make more profit at the end of the day. So if we can show that what we're doing did that, then we're at least in a good spot. But from a billing perspective, it's the same. Um, you know, William, when you talk about, you know, you really want to impact the bottom line and the profit. And you probably do things differently than a lot of agencies because yeah. you're asking for different things. Do you ever get pushback or objections when you're like, we want to see the PL? What, yeah, what do companies yeah. say? Well, there's there's two types. There's there's one, there's the companies that are smaller and could show us the PL, but just are more private and and just don't don't know if they're ready to do that, right? Like they're not maybe transparent with what they're doing. Uh, and then you've got the much, much bigger companies where it's such a big organization and and this even the person we're talking to on the marketing team doesn't have anywhere close to that information. And so they're just like, we just don't even know how to make that happen. <laughs> um, and so there's two options. 
if if there's somebody that's willing to give us an analog to it, kind of like what I said, where it's like, well, can you give us a rough idea of like what your percentage that we could at least have a model that we can march out? And if something changes significantly from that model, we're still showing that what we're doing should be more profitable towards uh, for you. Um, unless something changes, if all of a sudden you just hired 10 more people, well, we need to adjust our model then accordingly. We don't need to know the exact numbers. Um, and, and so that's the easiest way to get around that objection. If that's still an issue for people, and it rarely is, but if it is, we just don't work with them. Uh, not because we don't want to, but they're just not ready for what we offer. And there are plenty of other agencies they can go work with that don't get into the bottom line. And, and that's fine. You know, William, you, you've had a very interesting trajectory and path in your career. Okay, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit, but um, you know, it started off in nursing, yeah, and then went to e-commerce, and then went to what you're doing now. When you were young, growing up, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> so the the number one thing, and I'd still say, I I kind of still say this, is to be an inventor. I just like coming up with new ideas and doing things that other people hadn't thought of. And I like doing it from a different perspective. And, and so for lack of a, a, a clear way of explaining this, um, I, I like to study even a lot within string theory and things like that. And I've got some ideas about stuff there. And I've, I've written like some different math proofs and stuff like that, where I just, I like looking at things and trying to figure out how to solve problems. Um, I also really like helping people. And so all of those things that I've done along the way were solving problems and helping people. And now we're just doing that in a different environment, if that makes sense. And that's what happened, kind of transitioning you into e-commerce. You were in nursing and you were trying to figure out how to solve this shift issue. Exactly. Right? And so what happened yep. from there? Yeah. So I was uh, at the time a, a uh, per diem nurse. And so what that meant was I, I didn't work on a specific floor. I had actually been trained. I started off in open heart, got trained in every unit of the hospital, essentially. Um, the only thing I didn't do was maternity or pediatrics. So I stayed out of that. It was not my, my cup of tea. But so I could call into the hospital every night and say, hey, do you need anybody literally anywhere in the hospital? Uh, and there was always a need, right? As you can imagine, that's hard to staff because you don't know who's going to get sick tonight or how many people or what floor needs somebody. And um, and so it was easy for me to come in and, you know, well, now I'm making double time or whatever. And uh, that was good. And, and I enjoyed it because I was, again, helping people. But I started to realize I was like, well, this is a problem at our hospital and it's hard for the hospital then. And it means that people aren't necessarily getting the care that they would all like to get as well, because it's like, well, they were maybe understaffed on this or this. and It would be better if they weren't. Um, and I realized, well, that's also a problem at a lot of other hospitals. What if I could help solve that problem? Um, and so I actually started meeting with a, uh, a guy named Chad Halverson. And at the time he ran a company called when I work, um, uh, cause I wanted to use his API. He had already built out like this scheduling software, but it was for everybody else outside of the hospital. You could use it for the hospital, but it really wasn't built in a way that would sustain the way that the hospitals worked and functioned. Um, and, and to take this back, this was 2000, boy, maybe 2014, 2013, I think. Um, you know, a lot of the scheduling at the hospital was taking place on paper and pencil because it was just on the fly as they're like, oh, we just discharged this patient. We just got these two admits. And so it's just not even Excel, right? Paper and pencil. Um, and so uh, when I wanted to use his API to build out the rest of what I was doing, um, we had a lot of meetings and started talking. And he said, listen, I also see that you have a degree in marketing. And uh, I see some of these other things that you've done. And I had started this website called Six Figure Nurse. And there were the, uh, these other things that I had done within the space. And he said, we're, uh, we just got our VC uh, funding, our first round, our Series A. I'd, I'd like for you to actually come and lead our marketing team. Clearly, you understand the concept and the problem um, and, and how you're trying to address it. Uh, what if you just do that? And so that's kind of what led into my, my foray into SaaS. And so well, that, was that Celebrate or is that... Yeah, no, that was a, co a company called When I Work. Uh, oh. Celebrate came a little bit later when I officially went out on my own. So then how did we get, you know, then you, you're you in the e-commerce universe, right, with Celebrate? Yeah, so the e-commerce transition happened after I uh, left When I Work. Uh, there was an e-commerce store that I knew. Um, they were... Uh, you know, they were growing pretty fast. They were still on Magento at the time and uh, the website was bad. And they said, Hey, could you help us grow our website? And they were actually doing pretty well. Um, I, I don't think I'm allowed to say how well, but they were doing pretty well. 
Um, and I said, I looked at what they had and I was like, there's literally nothing I could do that won't grow your store. <laughs> like, despite all that they were doing, it was just, it was, you know, abysmal, the marketing that they had going on. Uh, and so I came on board with them and, and we expanded them really fast. I want to say that we went from maybe 3000 products to 70,000 products in the matter of like, you know, six months or something just ridiculous. Um, and so as we continue to grow there, I was writing about what I was doing on Fast Company, on Entrepreneur and different websites. Uh, and people came out and said, hey, well, can you help us grow our, our business? And I was like, well, sure, why not? I know people who can I can pull in to do different things and I like helping. So yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And one of those companies was Cellbrite. Um, and Cellbrite at the time was out of Idea Lab out in Pasadena. So if you're familiar with Bill Gross, um, just an awesome incubator there. And, um, when I came on board there, uh, they, so their, uh, inventory and listing management software for e-commerce stores. So if you're on Amazon and eBay and your Shopify store, and you've got one product left, uh, you know, all of those need to know that. And so if you just sold out on the store, you need to make sure that that inventory is now uh, sent over to Amazon and eBay to say, Hey, there's nothing more in stock. And so there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. Well, that's where Chad Rubin and I became, uh, you know, arch enemies. If you those were those were my words, not yours. So I'll take credit. For <laughs> yeah, that. yeah. I mean, we were competitors, right? We're like very direct competitors. Um, and and here's a fierce competitor, and I appreciated that. And I think that that's what you and I talked about. It's like I like people that you know push you and challenge you, and they're you know not going to let you have the easy road uh, out. And so, you know, we we had a lot of fun. And Celebrate eventually was the one that was acquired by GoDaddy. I know Scubana then Chad's company was acquired, and you know there was a it was a good run. There was a good group of us uh, for a few other products that were similar that we, you know, would meet up at the different trade shows and uh, have a good time, uh, you know, happily, happily competing, if that makes sense. So we'll, we'll go to how do you grow e-commerce companies now? But back sure. when that company was on Magento and you were helping these, what were you doing then to help grow some of these e-commerce companies? Yeah, I mean, at the start for them, that's where we started transitioning into, you know, looking at growth a little bit differently. Um, at the time, I feel like, you know, the industry in e-commerce was still very young. Um, and a, a lot of people that were in it were, there was just a lot of, like, let's say, new founders who got into it because they had this idea, not because they understood business concepts or things, right? Um, and so uh, one of the things that we were looking at from them is, you know, if we begin to acquire new customers, willing to pay maybe a little bit more to acquire that new customer, if we're not looking at necessarily making money on month one, if you have to make money on that first transaction, maybe you're paying $10 to acquire that customer. But if you look at their 90 day LTV, you might say, well, here's what I'm going to make within 90 days on them. Why don't we actually spend $25 to acquire them? Now you can go out and be a lot more aggressive. Whereas a lot of businesses, you know, their first focus is they say, how do we get the, you know, acquisition cost to be as low as it possibly can. And it's like, well, I can get your acquisition cost down to a dollar if you're willing to only take one customer a month, if that's what you want, right? How about we instead see how can we maximize the overall profitability at scale? That would be the more ideal way. Um, and so that's kind of one of the things we started looking at it was like, how do we make sure that we go after more net new people um, in, in a more aggressive way, knowing that those people end up uh, benefiting us down the line. So we started looking a lot more at LTV, looking at our CAC, our customer acquisition cost, um, and and using that to help grow that. And the way to do that then was, uh, you know, through through advertising is one of the best ways to do that. So, you know, advertising on Facebook ads. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, TikTok wasn't even around then, um, so I'm trying to remember the channels that we used. Um, but a lot of it came down to making sure that how do we go after those people. Um, and this started coming down to, you know, even partnerships. So uh, th this company was called Dollar Hobbies and they sold RC cars and, and drones. And so how do we actually find out where everybody is doing um, the different uh, races, the RC car races? How do, we, how do we sponsor the races? How do we get involved with them? So that way, if, hey, they break parts and they need new parts. They're coming to us, right? And it's very similar to maybe what NASCAR is doing, right? You've got people that are sponsoring the cars and stuff like that. Um, and just getting involved really into the hobby. The idea there is, it's like, if you're involved with your customer's lifestyle and their hobby, you know their needs better, and then you're there and they want to help support you ongoing, even if your price was a little bit higher, they just like that you're a part of what's going on too. What made you think uh, and really measure it on lifetime value of a, a customer and other people weren't? Um, 
coming from the SaaS background. So in SaaS, one of the most common things is to look at your CAC LTV ratio, right? Or your LTV CAC, depending on which direction you want to go with it. But, you know, a lot of times people would throw out a number of, oh, it needs to be three to one or it needs to be four to one. Well, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter, at least on the e-camera side, whether it's a three to one, four to one, whatever you're talking about, but other understanding, like where do you need to be for you to be profitable? A three to one for one company might be profitable, but uh, a three to one for somebody else means that they're losing money. And so just figure out where that number is based on their overhead and expenses and cogs and stuff. Right. Um, and so it's just that idea of figuring out this is just a fun math problem. Um, and I got to give credit to the guys who I, I was with there at Dollar Hobbies. They're, they're also geniuses in their own right, where uh, they had developed an algorithm uh, that would uh, sell through different parts um, at different velocities. So that way, if there were, you know, maybe like one thing comes in with like 10 different parts. Well, if you're re continually replacing those 10 parts, but this one you've got like an overstock of and this one keeps selling through, it would adjust the prices on the fly to make sure that we were always maximizing the, you know, all of these products moving at the same time too. Um, but yeah, so it came down to just saying, how do we look at this from, uh, that SaaS model that I've been using it when I work and things and say, how do we apply that to what we're doing here in e-commerce? You know, yeah. And that's what you look at is the profit and then lifetime value. And I remember, cause I went to um, one of my friends, Brian Kurtz had a conference is Titans of direct response conference. And one of the session leaders uh, that was presenting was Greg Ranker of proactive. And, you know, that's a billion dollar company. And he was talking exactly about what you're saying is just, I think I don't remember the exact numbers, but they wouldn't be profitable, let's say, until month 14. But sure. they knew month 14. So they they could spend, outspend all of their competitors, just like what you're saying, because they were focused on lifetime value, not optimizing the first purchase. It was so as like for me, that was like, whoa, blew my mind. You were thinking about this way before. Well, yeah, I mean, and I don't know if I was thinking about it way before he was or anything either, right? It's just like one of those things that a lot of people weren't thinking I mean, or talking before or me, doing about. Not Greg Ranker. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, to, to your point, though, I love that you said it's like you could outspend your competitors. And that's the thing to recognize is that, like, if you're coming in here and you're not being willing to be aggressive about acquiring those customers, you're competing against a lot of other people that are thinking about it this way. And you're just not going to be competitive in the marketplace then. Let's talk about, I want to walk through uh, a couple examples so people can understand a little bit more about what you do. Um, let's talk about Power Pony. I don't yeah. own one, but but tell me about it. I mean, you should. It's fun. Uh, I've ridden one. So it's a it's a children's uh, like rideable. It's a it's it's a it's a pony, right? Uh, you can ride on and it's a lot of fun. It goes fast. I want to say like 20 miles an hour or something, right? Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it was, uh, invented by, uh, this girl Mia and I, I trying to remember how old she is. I think she's 12 now, but when she invented it, she was quite a bit younger, maybe eight. Um, and we helped launch them. So we, we got to start with them from, you know, first sale, very first sale, which was exciting. Um, and in, you know, we've had two, uh, two how did you meet with them? them now. Um, so one of our, uh, customers uh in, in slash partner uh jimmy clark he actually has a number of brands that he runs just like let's say top level growth for um and he brought us in and somebody that we've done a lot of work with on a lot of other brands and you know he says hey these are the best guys to work with for for growing your store so he brought us into it um and one of the things that i love is and we can't take credit necessarily for these but as a result of the ads that we're doing um, these things are getting seen by a lot of people, right? And and Jimmy's very influential and, and has helped them get on a lot of other really great shows, um, you know, the Today Show and, and stuff. But um, Paris Hilton's mom, um, Kathy Hilton, uh, said that she saw these on Instagram is what I uh, remember uh, hearing. She saw these on Instagram. Well, you know, we run the Instagram ads. And so I'd, I'd like to think that it was an ad that we were running. Um, she didn't specify which thing she saw. But um, so as a result, she bought some for Paris Hilton. Um, and then she also bought one just recently for Rihanna's uh, boy that was just born. Um, and so it's just really, I don't know, it's just been a fun brand to see how it grows. It's such an exciting toy. Um, but that's one of those examples where it's like, you know, good advertising has all of, let's say, the direct click through attribution. But there's a lot of people that are also doing other things. And there's a number of sales that are happening as a result of people just seeing the brand out there in the environment. Yeah, it it starts to become mainstream the more people see it and get it. And and the uh, you know, the the stats are 
you know, if they're selling a certain number of them, it's going to fall into some influencer's hand at some point. Yeah, exactly. Which makes it, you know, then continue to have even more likes and take off even more. Um, let's talk about a different industry, golf, for example. Sure. So one of my favorite clients in the golf space, so we've got a few that I really like, but uh, one that I think just stands out for me is uh, Snell. Um, Dean Snell, uh, the owner of Snell, actually is the inventor of the Titleist Pro V1 golf ball. Um, and he also has his name on the patents for, I think, like 30 other golf balls. Like, I mean, this is the guy that designs the best golf balls in the world. Uh, and he went out on his own and started his own company, Snell Golf, and designed, yet again, the next best golf ball in the world. So when I say next best, I mean, not, not second best, the best golf ball, right? Um, and so my golf spy, I think, has done reviews, like, you know, third-party reviews, saying that this out hits the Titleist Pro V1. Um, it's a fantastic golf ball for less money than what you would pay for the Titleist Pro V1. Um, and they're another example where I can remember them coming to us before and they were killing it on, you know, let's say like, it, you know, in pro shops and, and stuff like that. Uh, and when uh, their director of marketing, Jason, came to us and, and said, you know, hey, do you think you can help us grow? And I remember looking at the brand, um, looking at what they were doing on marketing and, and without saying, you know, where they were at, they were spending next to nothing in comparison. Uh, and it was one of those things was like, absolutely. You have exact all the markets of what we want to see, which is you know, you're, you're, you've got product market fit, you've got the right product, you've got the inventory that you need. It's just a matter of now being able to take that, tell that story in the right way in an ad format and make sure that we get that in front of the right people. Um, and then things, you know, take off from there. Um, which actually reminds me of a conversation I had recently about um, liquid death. Are you familiar with them? I've heard of it. Is someone was telling me about it. Is it like a seltzer water? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just basically canned water. Like, I, maybe there's some seltzer in it too. I don't even remember, but it's it's just water, right? Like, there's nothing else special about it. It is no different than any of the other waters that basically exist out there, other than you know, it's in a can. The thing that sets them apart, though, from a product perspective, it's like the product is the same. Their marketing is absolutely insane. Um, and if people haven't seen their their marketing, you got to go look at it. It's it's very irreverent, um, but it gets attention. Um, and the thing that I think I really appreciate about it is that there are some brands where it doesn't actually matter who runs their ads. Liquid Death would be an example of that, where you could put a five-year-old in that ad account and it's going to perform very well because they just have the branding that's going to do well. Then there's the flip side where you have the other brands where it doesn't matter who's running the ads. There is a significant limit to what kind of results they're going to have. For us, it's about finding that right mix. We're coming alongside to help people that maybe they have a real, they have some kind of product market fit and they're saying, hey, we want to, you know, accelerate what we're doing. And so then we're trying to figure out how do we maximize that on a technical level? And then how do we begin maximizing that on like your product offering mix, things like that. And we don't get into product offering or things like that, but we're at least trying to look at that and point you in the right direction. We say, here's where we can plateau from a technical advertising perspective and here's where we think, you know, the, the the other gaps are within what you're doing. And here's the people that we think that can solve those for you. So when we look at who is a perfect fit for you, one, the company is product market fit. You mentioned, uh, you know, with the Snell Golf that they had the inventory infrastructure capabilities um, figured out. Um, and for some, there may be gaps. You see some gaps in their marketing. What else is uh, a check mark that would be that you look for that's a perfect fit for you as a as a client? Yeah, perfect fit is going to be on Shopify. We do have clients that are on Magento. We have clients that are on uh, you know uh, .net, like other other versions of e-commerce. But for us, perfect fit is is Shopify. There's just so many reports that we have built out very, very nicely for the Shopify infrastructure that that I like. Um, but otherwise, none of those other things are going to take us away from uh, what we think is is uh, a worthwhile client. Um, ideal client size, spending at least $100,000 a month, uh, only because the level of what we're going to do within their ads account works significantly better if they have uh, like data to play with where, you know, I think I told you about the one client where we can show that there's a difference in profit month over month from them coming with us of $800,000. Uh, I've got a couple more over here that I'm, that I'm literally looking at where it was like $437,000 literally within one month of profit change. 
And so those are the ones where we'd say, we are putting our resources to the best use to help companies uh, in that environment, because I don't think, I got to look at this again. I don't think there's a single person on our team that has less than five years experience. Um, the majority have, you know, close to 10 or 10 plus years experience coming from big, big agencies. We brought in, you know, the best of the best. And so we want to put these on accounts that we think we can make significant, massive impact for in a very short amount of time. If we're bringing on a company that's maybe only spending $10,000 a month, we can make a big impact for them, but they usually aren't going to be able to ramp up their inventory production accordingly and things like that. There's just a lot that they haven't figured out. That doesn't mean we don't like them. We have a whole separate program for them called our accelerator program. We like them still because those are the ones that are fun where you get them in here and you say, nobody knows who they are. Nobody maybe even necessarily wants to work with them, but we want to take a shot at seeing what if, what if they could be the next, you know, snow golf, liquid death, whomever. Um, let's, let's give this a shot. So we love bringing them in here and seeing, you know, what can we do with them? Do you have cases where someone isn't spending like a hundred thousand or spending much less because, but they're in retail, but they're spending a lot in general. So they have the infrastructure, but maybe they haven't turned on the ads yet at all, or is that less common? Yeah. So that was probably a big thing that happened over the last uh, two years, right? Um, a lot of that happened as a result of COVID, where there are a lot of businesses that had next to nothing going on online right now, but all of a sudden they're not getting the sales that they wanted to in the stores. Department stores weren't buying what they used to buy and things like that. And so they said, we got to figure this out. So we we do have a couple of clients. I, I can't name their names right now, but the one is also in the golf space as well. Um, and there's a number of, of brands that we were able to bring on um, essentially from nothing, right? Where they had almost no e-commerce sales at all uh, to scaling quite nicely. And I think the one brand that I'm thinking of in the golf side, um, I, I believe as of January this year, they are officially completely out of uh, all of the wholesale side of business. They've gone fully into um, e-commerce. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend that as for most brands. I actually think that the, the right amount is the blend of both, uh, but that was just where they were seeing the best uh, profit and growth. And so they just went all in on that. Um, the thing that's fun with those brands is because they have the inventory, because they already have some recognition, you can usually get like an instant, um, an instant win for them, which is really nice. Where it gets tricky for them though is a lot of times they're still stuck in like the catalog days, not necessarily in in terms of uh, you know actual catalogs, but they're stuck in like the the marketing that they have around this can sometimes be very generic product descriptions, some very uh, basic images. They don't have any UGC built out. There's just a, a big lack of, let's say, content ready for us to use for ads. And so for them, the biggest thing that we end up having to focus on is we need to really start generating a lot more creative assets that we could use for the ads to test things out because they're missing those things that are just these clear differentiators from like a, a normal D to C type uh, approach. William, you may not have an answer for this, but I'm going to ask anyways. Um, I love it. Um, are there companies out there right now that you think are a perfect mix of this um, that you're like, oh, we would kill it for these brands? Who are some of the brands that when you look at, you're like, oh, th this is someone I think we could really help? Oh, man, that's a good question. Uh, th there's nobody that I pinpoint and say, like, in my mind, this is exactly who it is, but it's, it would be anybody that is is has found some product market fit and they're they're just not getting the results that they'd like to get from this. I would say one of the one of the key pieces is if every agency has told them so far that they just need more creative and their creative is stale, likely that would be a perfect fit for us. Like if if you have agencies telling you this, because one of the I think that's a big um a red flag that the agency you're working with likely is just not uh, s smart enough to figure out what what's what's actually going on underneath all of the different scenes. So that agency is also likely not feeding Google the data of your cogs, right? Like just to put that in perspective, like they're not they haven't actually maximized what they think they know. They just maximized likely they're they're a creative, more focused agency, and that's what they know. And they're just saying we just need more creative. Um, what I've found though is through a lot of testing, what we've found. Um, there was an ad that we were running, and this was uh, when we were at GoDaddy um, and uh, for, you know, and Cellbrite. So I want to say it was like four or five years running. It didn't matter who else tried to make ads for this. 
like world class ad people. The ad that we had running for four or five years was the best ad. Uh, it just continued to go on and on and on and on and on, and nothing could beat it. And so I think the idea of like ad creative fatigue uh, gets overused for somebody basically saying, I'm not analytical enough to figure out what else is going on, but I know that if you just give me some new ad creative, I can make it work. And that's true, right? Like you can, but that's not the only thing there. So if, if you're hearing that, that would be an ideal customer. When you say that about the more creative, I picture the, I don't know if you've seen the Saturday Night Live skit, more cowbell. That's uh, yes. <laughs> That's I, my made picture. That, I made that meme literally exactly that for that thing. It was like, we need more creative. Well, who are some other companies that you admire their marketing? You mentioned Liquid Death. Who else do you kind of study from afar and think they're doing some cool things? Um, you know, as a general rule, I really appreciate a lot of um a lot of the stuff that went through like the disruptors, right? So there's, we have like the D to C disruptors. And that's like this category now that we have of people like Purple Mattress is a good example. Like they did a fantastic job of coming up with ads that I think really got outside the box of what they were doing. Um, I appreciate that. So from a, from a creative standpoint, from a positioning standpoint, I think they nailed it. And again, they're another brand that I would say almost without having to try you could have found good profitability within the ads account um another one that i think that i appreciated uh was you know this is a this is an old commercial but uh barbie has a really good commercial out there i don't remember how long ago this was maybe 10 years ago um but they really got into like the emotional side of of the buying uh persona and so see if you remember this commercial. i think i know what you're i think i know what you're gonna say but but okay yes. So you see, um, you see, and I'm trying to remember the direction that this went, but like you see this, uh, I think like this little girl, like, and, and maybe the one little girl is dressed up and she is delivering a speech to a, a room full of, um, you know, like college students and she's a professor. And then you see this other little girl and she's dressed up as a doctor and, and she's visiting her patient. And you see these girls go through these different, um, you know, careers and, and, and things. And then at the very end of the commercial, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it again. At the very end of the commercial, um, it, it actually shows that this little girl is actually playing with her Barbie dolls right then and there, right? And so it's like she was just imagining and dreaming all of these things. Um, and as a father, I have three three daughters, and, and I love that just thinking it's like that is what Barbie is selling. Really, they're not selling just, you know, plastic toys for people to play with. They are selling the ability for kids to dream Um that is the kind of thing that I think really helps you to stand out and go from just selling. And I think that we got into a habit of that uh, over the last few years of just like selling products versus selling what the company is doing, what it stands for, where it's going and why. I like to see that we're getting back into a shift back towards that though again. Talk about parenting and family um, balanced with entrepreneurship running a company. Um, I think... Anybody will tell you that it's probably the hardest thing that you will ever do in your life. Um, I don't, I don't have that all the way figured out, but I try to do the best I can. And I'd say that if I was going to tell anybody anything, just remind yourself that you're doing the best you can. Um, there are, there are periods of time where, you know, you have to go all in on the company because, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you lost your, your biggest client or something. And so you're saying, Hey, we got to double down and I've got to focus on this and, and figure this out or, or some other you know, problem that's come up or fire or whatever. Um, and then there are times where, you know, you, you, you've got to make sure that you're there for your family during that. Like there's some, you know, big crisis there, or, or even just making sure it's your, you know, kid's birthday. It's like, you can't miss those things. You only get one chance with them. And so, um, there's an article I wrote uh, about this and it's, it's as much a call to other entrepreneurs as it is a call and a reminder to myself, um, which talks about, don't be like Elon Musk when you take your last breath. Um, and I, here's the thing. I actually love Elon. I, I think he's a, a genius in so many ways and, and, and I follow him and I, I really appreciate a lot of uh, what he does and stuff, but you know, it's the idea of it's like, like super incredible, like work, 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 work all the time. And, and I've had my stages like that. Um, but the reality is I, going back to my nursing days, I've, I've physically held the hand of a lot of people as they took their last breath. I have felt life leave the human body. And there's not a single time that any single one of these people ever said, I really wish I would have worked more. I really wish I would have been more successful and worked more. If I would have just made this little bit more money, then I would feel better on my deathbed. 
100% of the time, you know, if they had anything more to say, it was, you know, I, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I wish I would have done a few of these other things. Um, and so I think that, you know, the idea here is just keeping that in in your your focus and remembering that even as an entrepreneur, it can feel like everything maybe weighs up to you. Um, but just remember that it's like, there's things that you can't see that are on the other side of this. And so for, for me, um, I'm a believer in in God. And so for me, when I approach this, I think I can see what's on my timeline within, you know, like, let's say two dimensional timeline, I can see what's right here. And I can see that, hey, if we lose this client, I can't pay this or do this or whatever. What I don't know is what's on the other side of that timeline, because I'm blocked by that. But but God can see what's on the other side of that. And if, if, you, if you're not a believer, maybe you think the universe or whatever, right? But like, uh, there's something on the other side of that timeline. It may be that you need to lose that customer because on the other side of that lost customer is a bigger, better customer that is even more of a, a fit for you. And so just remember that it's like just what you might think is is a logical next step. You don't know what's the step that's after that that might actually be better. And so give yourself the grace and break too. I love uh, hearing your evolution from nursing to SaaS to e-commerce SaaS to actually agency owner. And you mentioned sometimes you can't see on the other, what's on the other side, but you have mentors, right? That yeah. can sometimes yep. see. And there was an instance where you told one of your mentors one of your issues and they started laughing at you. Yes. Good mm -hmm. memory. Um, yeah, I, I can remember. And what I, were I they laughing say, at? I want to say uh, it was a moment where I had, had, had tried to change up a little bit of our positioning, I think. Um, and um, as a result of that, uh, we lost three good customers. Uh, now, at the time, I'm just seeing this as we just lost a lot of revenue. Um, and so I can just remember just thinking that it's like, I just make the wrong decision here. Like, this is dumb. Like, what did I do? Um, and I remember telling you about it and I was, I was pretty bent out of shape about it. Um, and without even meaning to, uh, so my mentor here is Dave Mortensen. He's the, the founder of Anytime Fitness. And I can remember him just belly laughing at me, just like laughing. Right. And not at me, but it was exactly what I needed at the time. Um, because it, it was that way where you realize I'm freaking out about something that's not that big of a deal. It's just not. Um, customers come and go. Uh, and, you know, th those customers have since been replaced by better, bigger customers that fit what we were trying to do even more. Um, and, and I think it was easy for him to laugh at it the way that we maybe laugh at little kids who are, you know, bothered by, you know, you know, she called me a poo poo head. <laughs> it's like, you can't help but laugh a little bit. Cause you're just like, I think that's kind of silly and it's not really a big problem, but when you're four, you know, being called a poo poo head is the worst thing you could possibly imagine. Um, but I think being able to see the, you know, the levity of the situation there, um, it, it was warming to my heart and helped me realize. <laughs> I'm laughing because that happens often in my, I have two daughters and my wife and daughters will be doing something. I'll start laughing and they will all turn on me and start yelling at me. <laughs> like, how do you think this is funny right now? So sure. I can kind of relate to your mentor probably on, on that front. Um, let's talk about best workplace. So what are the sure. things that you do as a company to achieve that? So I think it starts with a mindset. The 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 mindset that I have uh, and have had, and I would say now our company has as well, um, is what do people want from a job? There, there, there's a lot of things, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of these studies that say that people don't leave because of the money. They usually leave because of something else, right? And so they might cite money as the reason why they're leaving, but it's just because they don't want to maybe acknowledge or even have a conversation or argument about what the other thing really is. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think that we all want intrinsically as human beings to, to is just to say control over our destiny and our future. Like that's ultimately what we want. And so that could be like our destiny and future as far as like um, how we spend our day and or our days, I should say, how we spend our time and, and how much money we can make. Like, do we have control over these things? Um, you can never have perfect control over that. There's this, you know, lie that you might think becoming an entrepreneur means that you're all of a sudden in charge of your every waking moment. And while you are, you aren't, you have customers that you are responsible for. You have bills that need to get paid. Like there are things you have to do, whether you want to do them or not. Otherwise you just don't have the business anymore. And so, you know, you're always going to have obligations and responsibilities. Um, uh, but as an employee, sometimes I could feel like there's, there's a lot more limitations there as a general rule. Um, and so what we've tried to do is, um, 
one, take care of like the basic needs uh, of like their basic human needs, which uh, from employee one, we made sure we had uh, health insurance where we cover 100% of their health uh, insurance, medical insurance and dental insurance. Um, because if you don't have to worry about that, that's just a, a big weight off of your shoulder, right? Um, the second part though is uh, we, we have unlimited PTO and I think that's gotten a bad rap from people a lot. I think the reason why it gets a bad rap though is because it just hasn't been managed well. I'm not saying that we've cracked the code on that, but we actually force people to look through their calendar, you know, at least on a quarterly basis and say, you haven't taken time off. You need to take some time off. Like, let's make this happen. And I, I think just about everybody is taking right close to four weeks off a year, at least right in, in more, if we can get to that point. But the, the idea here is it's like, if that's, you know, perfect powder just hit in, in Colorado and she want to get out there and go skiing. And it's like, that's a big thing to you. It's like, I want you to be able to have that ability to, to be able to do that. Now you have obligations to your clients. And so we have to make sure that that's everything is taken care of on that end. And so we've just kind of said, let's like, you have to figure that out. Is it something that you want to do a little bit when you're there and you're saying, Hey, I want to put in a little bit of time while I'm there, but I'm going to go work from there. Great. Awesome. Uh, we had a girl went, went, went and lived in Mexico for a few months. Great. Like, please do. Um, and so being able to, to to have that, the remote working environment and everything. Um, and then the other part is on the, the finance side. And so we have an unlimited bonus potential. So there's a part of the bonus that we tie towards just, you know, overall employeeship where, you know, this is based on your 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 ability to do like the, the basics of what we're asking you to do. And like, are you are you stepping up beyond that? Are you um are you, uh, you know, doing things that maybe aren't necessarily just revenue driving for the business, but like are just helpful and good to overall help perpetuate the business. But then there's a, a a bonus that's tied towards the actual amount of revenue that you generate for the business. And so if you help your clients grow, those clients that were maybe spending $10,000 a month when they came to us are now spending $100,000 a month, like we're getting more business uh, revenue as a company and, and we want you to benefit in that as well. And so everybody has that potential to say like, there is no cap to what you can make with us. Help us grow, help us scale, help us grow your clients. Your, your clients are happier now. We're happier now. You're happier now, right? Like that helps on that side of things. So I, I think this idea of like this being able to uh, have some influence over your destiny makes a difference. William, first of all, I have one last question. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey, your knowledge. It's pretty amazing the path that you've taken. Um, and I want to first encourage everyone to go to Element uh, E L U M Y N T dot com to learn more about what they're doing. My last question is: Just I know you um, read a lot. Distant mentors. You have you know actually in person mentors. Who are some of the resources or books? podcasts that you like or listen to that you'd recommend others? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I really appreciate is just a good old fashioned book book now, uh, you know, paperback. Uh, one of the books that I've really enjoyed uh, over the years that I've kind of find myself coming back to uh, again and again, actually, is the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Um, and I think it's just a good mindset shift for people to think about how do you batch things essentially? Like if I was going to sum that book up, it's just the idea. It's like, how do you get things to the point where they're automated and batched? And I think that's something that's important for every employee to do as well. Even within your job, um, there's this idea of like, you know, we talked about EOS, you have right person, right seat, you have the role and responsibility. It might be your responsibility for this to happen, but it doesn't mean you have to be the person that actually made that happen. How do you figure out how you can automate parts of your job, whether that's to chat GPT or to, you know, someone else, to interns, to whatever, but figuring out how to automate and batch things to be the most efficient. I think that's one of the books that I like the most. Um, otherwise, just other really good self-help books. I mean, we'll go back to How to Win Friends and Influence People. I've probably read that one dozens of times. There's classics like this, I think, for a reason. Um, and those are some of my favorites. Awesome. I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out Element dot com more episodes of the podcast and thanks so much thanks everyone thanks again what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walk through the fire came out better on the other side see nice like a beach if you find the sand right now i'm feeling like a hundred grand